chemical bonding. It's kind of like Sudoku. You just need to remember a couple of rules. And if you remember those, you should be okay. So let's have a look at our periodic table first of all, because this is really important. I've written on here the groups one, two, jump in all the transition metals to three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I put a zero there. And we'll talk about that in a second. We have this staircase starting with aluminium. That's a metal and it goes down like that. Everything to the left is a metal. Everything to the right is a non-metal. Here's the first thing you need to remember. Metals bond to non-metals ionically. That's ionic bonding. We'll talk about what that means in a second. Non-metals bond covalently. And finally, metals bond to themselves metallically. So there we go, three very important things that you need to remember. Now, in this video, you're gonna hear me talk about atoms wanting a full outer shell of electrons. So I'm gonna be anthropomorphizing these atoms because that's just the way I roll. But you should never ever in an exam write down that an atom wants to gain or get rid of electrons. But if it helps you understand things better, like it does for me, then here you go. We're gonna very quickly cover metallic bonding because that's a really easy one. All that you need to know for metallic bonding is that we have positive ions, a lattice of positive ions. Lattice just means a grid. I'm gonna write positive like that. Positive ion lattice surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons. Delocalized just means that they are not on the atoms themselves. And we know that has to be true because we've said that we have a positive ion lattice. An ion is any atom or molecule that has lost electrons. At GCSE, you might hear the term negative ion. Okay, it's not really true, but we'll stick with it for now. But here we are talking about positive ions, a proper ion. And incidentally, this is why metals make good conductors because the electrons are delocalized, they can flow easily. Okay, so we can forget about metallic bonding. Pick any metal, let's take iron, why not? If you have a bunch of atoms, stick them together, they will form this positive iron lattice with a sea of delocalized electrons. All right, moving on to the good stuff then. Let's talk about ionic bonding first because I think it's slightly easier than covalent bonding. Now, something that you need to remember at all times is that all atoms want is a full outer shell of electrons. And that goes for both ionic bonding and covalent bonding, but they achieve it with different means. Now, the group, that is the column on the periodic table of an element tells you how many electrons an atom has in its outer shell. And that's why if we have a look at group eight, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon, these are what we call the noble gases. Why? Because they are very, very, very unreactive. Now you might be told that they don't react at all when in fact that's almost true. They're just basically so unreactive because they already have this full outer shell of eight electrons and that's what most atoms want, that they don't want any more electrons. They don't wanna give any away. They don't want to gain any more. They are happy, they are noble. But for the rest of the riffraff elements to the left of them, none of these have a full outer shell of electrons. Generally, when we look at ionic bonding, we're looking at the elements in group one and two. So we're talking about lithium, beryllium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, and calcium. Those are usually the metals that are involved. How many electrons does lithium have in its outer shell? Well, it's in group one. So it has one electron in its outer shell. Tell you what, I'm just going to draw a lithium atom. There you go. I've drawn just its outer shell. I don't need to draw the shell beneath it. What about magnesium? Magnesium is in group two, so that means it has two electrons in its outer shell. Again, I don't need to draw the inner shells, which is a nice little shortcut. Now, both lithium and magnesium want a full outer shell of electrons, and that means eight electrons. How many electrons does lithium have to gain? Well, it has one, so it needs to gain seven electrons. Magnesium has to gain six. And that sounds like a lot of work. Is there something easier that they can do instead? Yes, there is. 
Instead of gaining electrons, what they can do is get rid of their outer electrons to leave their outer shell empty. So actually it's no longer their outer shell, it's the shell below that is now the outer shell. Same thing for magnesium. And so that's something you need to remember is that metals always donate electrons. They give their electrons away. They give them to the non-metals. Now when lithium gives its electron away, I can draw it like that and uh, I'm just going to draw its electron flying off like that. Okay, it's gone somewhere else, don't really care where it's gone. Now lithium, now lithium is missing one electron. And because electrons are negative, if we're down a minus, that means that lithium becomes Li plus. This is now an ion because it's no longer neutral. It has a charge. What about magnesium? If it gets rid of its two outer shell electrons, well, we're down two negatives. So take away two negatives, we end up with two positives. So Mg turns to Mg2+. Every single metal in group one makes the ion one plus. We don't write the one, we just write a plus. Every metal in group two forms the ion two plus. So whenever these metals are bonded to a non-metal, we have Li+, plus, Na+, plus, K+, plus, Rb+, plus, etc. Be2+, plus, Mg2+, plus, Ca2+, plus, and so on. That's always the way it goes. All right, so what about the non-metals? Non-metals accept electrons. Of course, they accept them from the metals, don't they? Let's have an example. Let's go with chlorine. So chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell because it is in group seven. Again, it wants a full outer shell of electrons. So is it gonna get rid of its seven electrons like the metals? No, of course not. It's much easier for it to accept an electron from one of these, let's say from the lithium, and now it has a full outer shell. Again though, it's no longer Cl, it's no longer neutral. We've added an electron, we've added a negative, it becomes Cl minus. What about if we have oxygen? Oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. How many does it want to have a full outer shell? That's right, it needs two. So let's say that it gets the two electrons from the magnesium and it's now got eight electrons in its outer shell. It is happy as it were, but of course it's no longer just oxygen, it's an ion, not quite, but we're gonna say it's an ion, but it's gonna be two minus because it's gained two electrons and electrons are negative. So what could you get asked about this? Well, you could get asked to give the chemical formula for a certain ionic compound. Now, when things bond ionically, they don't make molecules. Actually, what happens with ionic compounds is that we end up with a lattice kind of like with metallic bonding, but instead of just positive ions, we actually have just a grid of positive and negative ions, all just in together in a nice grid. There's not one single molecule. It's all just a big crystal, a big lattice of these ions. Okay, so let's say that we're asked to find the chemical formula, that is the symbol form of a certain ionic compound. Let's go with lithium fluoride. Now, lithium is in group one, so that means it has one electron in its outer shell. What does it need to get a full outer shell? Well, it just needs to lose that one electron. If it loses an electron, then its ion is Li+, plus, like we just saw. Fluorine is in group seven, so that means that it has seven electrons in its outer shell, so it needs to gain one electron to have a full outer shell. So what is its ion? It's F-. minus. These two now have a full outer shell. Where has the lithium's electron gone? It's gone to the fluorine, happy days. If we put these two together, do the pluses and the minuses, the charges, balance out? Yes, they do. So we can just say that actually the chemical formula for lithium fluoride is LIF. We do have the charges in there, they're still there, but we don't need to write them because they are all balanced out. What about lithium oxide? 
So again, we know that the ion for lithium is Li+. But what about oxygen? Well, it's in group six, so we know that it needs to gain two electrons. Huh. So if I stick these two together now, we have Li+, and O2-. So we have one positive charge and two negative charges. That doesn't balance out, does it? So that doesn't work. What do we have to do instead? If we double the number of lithiums, Li2, O, that means now that we have two pluses, two minus, and so therefore that works out. The charges all balance out. Let's go for magnesium chloride. Magnesium is in group two, so therefore it has to make a two plus ion. Chlorine is in group seven. Excuse my L's, that's how I write them. They almost look like E's, but they're just curly. Chlorine is in group seven, so therefore it just has to gain one electron in order to have a full outer shell. So once again, my charges are not balanced. I have two plus on the magnesium and one minus on the chlorine. What do I have to do? Well, I have to double up the chlorine. So now I have two plus two minus, because I've got two of them, and so that works. So whenever you are asked to give the chemical formula for an ionic compound, you just need to double or triple things up in order for the charges, the positives and the negatives, to balance. Let's try a harder one. Aluminium oxide. Now, I'm gonna stick in there aluminium three oxide. If you see a Roman numeral after the metal, that tells you what ion it makes. So it's going to make, well, we know it's going to be plus because all metal ions are positive, but it's going to be Al3 plus. Oxygen, as per usual, it's two minus. Oh dear, well, these definitely don't balance, do they? Because we have a three plus on the aluminium, two minus on the oxygen. What do we need to do? In order for these to balance out, we need to multiply these so we have the same charge. If we do Al2, we end up with six plus, because we've got two lots of this. So what do we have to do to the oxygen? We have to triple it. Six plus, six minus, jobs are good. So what about dot and cross diagrams then? So let's go with lithium fluoride. All we have to do is draw our lithium and a fluorine. We're going to stick square brackets around it, and we're going to put the electrons on for the fluorine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we know that it's gained an electron from the lithium, so we give that a cross. Now, the electron has disappeared from the lithium, so we're not actually going to draw that electron on there. So we'll be drawing what happened in the end to both of the atoms when they turn into ions. Finally, all we need to do is put the sign of the ion positive and the negative for the fluoride ion. What about magnesium chloride? Well, Similar idea, just going to draw the magnesium. Again, we know that it's going to end up with an empty outer shell there. And we're going to write chlorine there. We're going to stick electrons on it. We know it's gained an electron from the magnesium. And we know that chlorine is minus, And we know that magnesium is two plus. But the thing is, we know that, that magnesium chloride is MgCl2. So we're just going to stick a two down there to show that we do indeed have two lots of the chloride ions per magnesium ion. Now, hydrogen, technically it's in group one because it only has one electron in its outer shell, and that kind of makes it a metal, but hydrogen's a bit special because it can bond ionically and covalently. All right, in reality, it's somewhere in between. But we're just gonna stick with it can do both. An example of hydrogen bonding ionically is hydrochloric acid, which is H, Cl, the ions that form this are H plus and Cl minus. Let's think about another acid as well. Let's think about sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Now, what are the ions that make up this? Well, it's two lots of H plus. So where is the two minus coming from to balance out the two H pluses? Well, you may or may not know that SO4 is its own ion and it has the charge to minus. This is an example of a molecular ion. Let's think about the last common acid that we have, that's HNO3. Again, H plus is always the ion of hydrogen. So that must mean that this molecular ion here, 
is the nitrate ion NO3 minus. What about hydroxides? We talked about acids, let's talk about alkalis. We know that sodium is in group one, so it always forms the ion Na plus. So that means that this OH, again, is a molecular ion. We call that a hydroxide ion, and it has the charge minus. So that's an OH minus. And there are all sorts of different molecular ions, but those are the most common ones that we deal with. So what about when non-metals bond to each other? We said that that's covalent bonding. Now, here's the problem. Let's say that we have two fluorines that want to bond together. They both have seven electrons in their outer shell. Is one of the fluorines going to give one of its electrons to the other one? Okay, well, one of the fluorines ends up with a full outer shell, but then the other one only has six electrons. That's no use at all. What do they do instead of donating and accepting electrons? They share electrons. And again, that's in order to get a full outer shell. So let's take fluorine. We call the group seven elements here the halogens, and all of these go round in pairs. And that's because they can't go round by themselves because they don't have a full outer shell by themselves. Now we can draw a skeletal formula, much like what we do for our hydrocarbons, just FF. Whenever you see a line on skeletal formula, that is a covalent bond. Now, why don't fluorines go round in triplets? Well, they have seven electrons already, so they only need to get one electron from another fluorine by sharing in order to be satisfied. Let's draw this dot and crosswise. Now, fluorine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons, and the other fluorine has seven as well but we know that one of these is going to be shared. So let's just check now. Does this fluorine on the left have a full outer shell of electrons? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, it does. This one here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, it does. Just by sharing one electron each, they now have a full outer shell of electrons each. And so whenever you have a covalent bond, you always have a dot cross electron pair. That's always gonna be the case. Now, here's a quick little tip to help you remember how many bonds something needs to make. However many electrons needed, that equals number of bonds made. Let's have a look at all the elements in group seven, the halogens. They all need one more electron to have a full outer shell of eight. So they all make one bond. Group six, usually we're talking about oxygen and sulfur. They have six electrons in their outer shell, so they need to gain two electrons, so they both make two bonds. Nitrogen and phosphorus, they're in group five, they both need to make three bonds. And finally, carbon, it's in group four, it actually needs to make four bonds in order to have a full outer shell. What's the name of the phone company? It's O2, named after oxygen gas. Oxygens go round in pairs as well. But hang on a minute, it's in group six, so it needs to make two bonds. You're absolutely right. And so that's why if we draw the skeletal formula of oxygen, we need a double bond in between. Oxygen does indeed need to make two bonds. If we were to draw the dot and cross diagram of this now, like we said, whenever we see a covalent bond, there has to be dot and a cross electron pair. So we know that there is a double bond here. So we know we're gonna have a dot cross dot cross, there's two electron pairs there. Let's just fill in the rest on the oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It now has a full outer shell and the same for the other oxygen as well. What about ammonia? Ammonia is NH3. So we have a nitrogen in the middle. What group is it in? Group five. How many electrons does it need? One, two, three. And so therefore it's gonna make three covalent bonds. It's always going to make three covalent bonds. And in this case, it makes them with the hydrogens. And we know that it's going to look like this in the skeletal formula, the other way around. So we know we're going to have a dot cross, dot cross, dot cross. Are the hydrogens happy? Yes, because they only need one more electron to have a full out of shell. They're the element that bucks the trend. They don't need eight, they only need two. And let's just check nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so we just need seven, eight, and all five of nitrogen's electrons are there. Let's try methane, CH4. Carbon in the middle, 
four hydrogens around the outside because what group is carbon in? Group four, so therefore it needs to make four bonds. And again, we have four bonds, so each bond must have dot cross electron pair. Are the hydrogens happy? Yes, they are. They've each got two electrons now. Carbon, one, two, three, four, and the extra four electrons from the hydrogen. It now has a full outer shell of eight. Let's do one more. Let's do carbon dioxide, CO2. We know that carbon is in group four, so it needs to make four bonds. So actually, carbon dioxide, if you draw it, skeletal formula, is a carbon in the middle of two oxygens with a double bond to both. Let's just check. Oxygen needs to make two bonds because it's in group six. Carbon needs to make four bonds because it's in group four. That is correct. So let's just try and draw this. And we know that we have a double bond on either side, so we have to have two pairs of dot cross electrons. So the carbon is happy because one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but then we need to finish off with our oxygens. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So the trick is, don't forget that once you've drawn your dot and cross diagram, just have a check. Does each of your atoms have a full outer shell of electrons? You can pretty much guarantee that in your exam, you are gonna to have to draw a dot and cross diagram, and it's gonna be worth a couple of marks, so it's worth getting your head around. Now, we've drawn a bunch of molecules there. That kind of bonding is called simple covalent bonding. And that's a simple covalent structure. So something like methane, carbon dioxide, oxygen. However, you can also get giant covalent structures. So when you have a diamond, this is effectively one giant molecule. That's kind of crazy, isn't it? So what does that mean going on inside? Well, that means that, okay, we have a bunch of carbons just bonded together. Um, I'm gonna draw this 3D. You won't have to draw it 3D. We have one carbon, we know it's bonded to another four carbons, but each one of those is bonded to another four carbons. And each one of those is bonded to another four carbons, and so on and so forth. So effectively, what we end up with in the end is a giant tetrahedral, because that's the shape of the bonds, grid of carbon atoms. And that's what we call giant molecular structure. Another example of this is graphite. Now graphite is weird because it almost bucks a trend. So we have carbons all bonded to each other like that, but uh, can you see how many bonds is each carbon making? Well, I haven't drawn the ones coming off here, but if I were to draw them, they'd go out like that. Each carbon is bonding to three more carbons. Hmm, here's what happens. If we have a few layers of these carbons bonded to more three carbons, we actually have something weird going on. We have the extra electrons not being used, being used to bond the layers together. So these are intermolecular bonds due to delocalized electrons. So if these layers are bonded weakly together, what does that mean? It means that the layers can slide over each other easily. What's that good for? Well, it's good for pencils. That's good for lubricants as well. So there's a couple of uses of graphite because we have these weak intermolecular bonds due to the delocalized electrons in between the layers. And that's bonding in a nutshell. If you have any questions or if you have any suggestions what you'd like to see next, pop it in a comment down below. If you found this video helpful, then make sure you leave a like and I'll see you next time.